Okay, everyone, we're about to start. Um, we have Angus Kidman here. Angus is the editor of Life Hacker Australia and has been writing about technology topics for about 15 years now. <laughs> and this will be his seventh linux.conf.au, we say LCA this year. We're having a talk on cheap tabloid tricks, the truth about Linux, open source, and the media. So, welcome. Talk. Okay, thank you very much, thank you very much. Now, before I get going properly, um, a little bit of non-housekeeping. I tend to talk really, really quickly when I get excited, and I'm probably going to get excited by this topic at some point. Now, I'm, get, I'm going to do my very best to um, you know, uh, use presentation voice, but I'm going to need your help. So, I'm going to hand out a few bits of newspaper here to people. Now, if, if I start speaking too quickly, I want you to throw pieces of newspaper at me. So, and this may have to happen a lot during the talk, um, but in the end, I think it'll work out better. So, anyone else desperate for a piece of newspaper, hang out, hang out for the option. So, oh, back row. I'm, I'm dubious as to whether people this far back are actually going to be able to, you know. There could be some physics involved here. So. Try people more phones go off. That could also be an added base. Oh, no, there's a backup supply here, so if people want to come and get more, then, yeah. That'll get us going, but yeah, it kick, it ties in with the tabloid theme here, so yeah, hopefully that'll help us out a bit. So, okay, so that was the tabloid attack. We're all good. <laughs> so, ever since I sort of put my name down to do this, the question that I keep getting from everybody is, you know, why are you doing this? You know, why have we got you know a journalist standing up in front of us talking to us? Because it seems that apparently there's some sort of rule that says you know journalists shouldn't speak at LCA unless they happen to be you know, Jonathan Corbett from LWN who's sitting here in the front row. He's allowed to do it, but not anybody else. Oh, there we go already. We have this interesting thing of the. Come on. Yes. It's... <laughs> There we go. Okay. Um, anyway, now, as it turns out, Jonathan is part of the reason why I decided I should um, give this talk. But we'll get to the reasoning behind why that happened in a little bit. So, the, the first reason I wanted to give the talk was just, you know, I've been coming to LCA for quite a while now, eight or so years, and I've written dozens and dozens of stories in consequence. and. It just seemed to me that, okay, maybe it was appropriate to try and give something back, to actually contribute something, <laughs> as well as coming here, soaking up information and taking it out to other people. So that was the first motivation. The second motivation was the fact that people do quite often come up to me, and this has happened all through my career, and they say, oh, how come you don't write more about Linux? How come you don't write about, uh, more about open source? How come you're always writing about Windows? You know, um, why, why don't we see more coverage of open source generally in the media? Why doesn't that happen? So, um, you know, there's, there's definitely a perception that there's a bit of a problem here. Now, I think you know, the open source community in many ways is you know, quite realistic. You know, I think they understand what's going to get covered and what won't. You know, I don't think anyone in this room is expecting to see you know, a picture of um, Landis Torvalds on the front page of the Herald Sun unless he happens to start dating a footballer's wife and then anything <laughs> is possible. <laughs> so, <laughs> But yeah. I think we know that that's actually not going to happen. So, but yeah, leaving those kind of extremities aside, yeah, there is definitely, yeah, there's a sense that yeah, maybe you know, Linux should get covered more often. Yeah, maybe Apple gets covered a little bit too much these days. Yeah, and uh, maybe a bigger sense that people don't understand the issues behind the particular products, that they don't understand the questions associated with freedom of information, open access to your data, open access to your code. So, now, you know, in point of fact, I think all that's true. We probably don't cover those things often enough. And I wanted to look into the reasons why, though, because I think often there's a bit of, you know, misunderstanding about why it is these things don't get, get written about. Okay, so the third reason, and the thing that really finally kicked me off to do something, as I said, was the presentation that Jonathan gave last year at um, LCA in Brisbane. Now, as a lot of you probably know, pretty much every year he gets up and he gives a presentation about you know, the state of the kernel, what's happened in the kernel in the year gone past. So, and he did that again last year. But right at the beginning of his presentation, um, 
you know, he had a bit of a whinge, basically. <laughs> he sort of discussed how the actual process, what happens in you know, developing the kernel, often sort of gets misrepresented and in the tech media. So, and that, you know, that this creates a sort of really bad look. And yeah, the specific example he gave was in an article by Catherine Edwards from IDG, who was covering the conference that year. Um, and she'd written a news article um, in which you know, she'd sort of talked about his presentation in Wellington the year before. Um, and during that presentation, there was actually a question from an audience member who sort of wanted to you know, ask about what was going on, sort of discussing, is it too hard for people to get involved? And um, Jonathan gave a fairly sensible, rational answer, which you can see up here. You know, any development process that takes code from 2,700 developers over the course of a year can't be too exclusive, but it can be intimidating to come into. Uh, there's been a lot of work done to make it easier for people to try and come into our community. Things have improved a lot, but there's a lot further that we can go. Now, there's nothing controversial or unbalanced about that quote. It's, you know, what was said. Um, it's probably a reasonable thing to report on. The issue and the, <laughs> the job is the way that got summed up in the opening paragraph, which was like this. Yeah, a key Linux contributor has admitted the developer community can be intimidating and hard to break into. Yeah, and yeah. That's, yeah, that's a bit over the top, and it all, it's all in that word, the word, you know, admit it, you know. That's the kind of thing you want to use in the context of something that's been repeatedly denied, and now the truth is finally coming out. I don't think anybody has spent the past 15 years saying, oh, wow, Colonel, balanced, reasonable, peaceful community, no arguments ever happening on that mailing list. <laughs> I just don't think anybody <laughs> has been looking at it that way. So, um, and in fact, yeah, anybody who's ever looked at the mailing list would know that it can be combative, it can be argumentative. So, in a sense, saying, oh, yeah, there are fights on there is not even really news. And yet, we've got admitted. It sounds like you know, it should be in the middle of a murder trial. So, yeah, and actually, that's not what that presentation was like. It was a civilised, balanced discussion. So you know, if I'd been participating in that, and I'd been reported in that way, I'm, you know, I think I'd be annoyed, just as Jonathan was. And so I was sympathetic to that argument. And then I paused and I thought to myself, ooh, hang on a minute. Let's have a reality check here. If I go and look up my name on Google, and the word admitted, is it possible that, you know, maybe I've done this once or twice as well? And yeah, it turns out <laughs> that this is definitely something that I do. <laughs> I am just as likely to throw the word admits into the middle of a sentence to create some drama. So, um, and in fact, yeah, it turns out I'm even keener on using the word conceded, which is <laughs> basically another variation, I think, on the same trick. Now, you don't want to read both those quotes, secondly the second one, because that clearly must be one of the dullest articles I ever wrote anyway. It might have needed all the liveliness you could get when you're talking about SAP upgrades, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, I, I can't say, oh, what Catherine did was an isolated example. We don't do it, yeah, because I think, yeah, journos, we all do it. Yeah, we may have secret lawyer fantasies, you know. It looks like, yeah, we, we want to cast ourselves as the prosecutor. We want to say, oh, what we've done is we've wrung this information out of somebody. We've really discovered um, what was going on. Rather than the more prosaic truth, I sat in a room, someone said something, I typed some notes, I wrote it down, and then, then afterwards, after the fact, you know, I tried to make it more dramatic than perhaps it actually was. So, look, I guess I'm, I'm pointing that out and I'm you know, implicating myself here and admitting my own guilt because I guess it's silly to pretend that I'm an observer of the media process and that I can talk about it from some sort of scientific, objective perspective, you know? I'm a participant, I'm very possibly part of the problem. So, you know, from that point of view, I guess what I'm hoping to offer is, you know, a bit of insight into why it is that that kind of reporting happens, why it is that open source doesn't get covered enough or gets covered wrongly, um, and why the things that sometimes the community is the most passionate about are the things that never seem to get written about. So I'm hoping that, you know, despite my evident flaws, I might be able to bring something to that discussion. Um, and I guess the other thing I should emphasise is, you know, ultimately this is just one person's view on how IT journalism operates, and it's a very Australian point of view at that. I've operated my whole career in Australia, so, you know, I can't claim to speak for the entire IT press, you know, any more than Tridge could claim to speak for the entire Samba community. You know, there's a big group of us, and some of us are going to disagree. 
Uh, that said, I've been doing this for an embarrassingly long time now. I've written for nearly everybody, so I guess I'm coming at it from more than a just one publication perspective. Anyway, enough rambling about me. Um, let's get to the first kind of question I wanted to ask, yes, the big one, which is, you know, is the IT media actually biased against open source? You know? does, does it get ignored? Do we even write enough about it? And I was thinking about this and it struck me, okay, one obvious way to start measuring that problem in this context um, would be to say, let's, let's have a look at what the technology media is doing this week to cover you know, a fairly major thing that's going on, which is LCA, which is this event. There are about 500 people here. That makes it one of Australia's biggest technology get-togethers. There's all sorts of luminaries. There's lots of stuff happening. You would assume that with a vibrant, competitive technology media that we have, that you know, this would be something that lots and lots of people you know, would go ahead and they think we ought to cover that. So I thought I've got to do this objectively, I've got to look at the biggest sites in terms of audience. So it turns out the biggest site, technology site in Australia is actually CNET in terms of audience. So let's have a look at CNET's front page yesterday afternoon and hunt down the LCA coverage in there. Yeah, <laughs> not so much. Now the second biggest site is actually the technology section of the Sydney Morning Herald. Again, not so much. And coming up in third place, um, we have the um, news.com.au's technology section. Again, not so much. Now, um, I, yeah, I, obviously this is not the whole thing. I promise you, I scrolled to the bottom of all these screens and I did not see one mention of the conference going on anywhere at all. So, yeah. And that's a little bit disappointing, obviously. So, sorry, I've just completely lost my place, which is a lesson that perhaps using a Kindle may not be the ideal way to work through. Oh, and he's been attacked. It was about time. So, okay. So, yeah, it does seem that in the case of those really big sites, it's not, it's not so much that, you know, it's being biased. It's just, it's invisible. <laughs> we can't even see it. But, you know, can we be reasonable about this? Can we say, okay, these are big mass market, you know, excitable kind of places, you know. Um, maybe, you know, they're very consumer focused. This is actually more of a hackers event, it's more of a professional event. Maybe we need to go down to the next level of site and sort of see what, you know, um, happens. Does it get better when we go to those outlets? And the answer is, it does, but it doesn't get heaps better. Now, I'll turn to myself here. Well, my main gig these days is I'm the, you know, the editor of Lifehacker Australia. And I'm going to have a bit of a boost mode moment here. We actually do pretty well when it comes to traffic. Um, right now, if you look at the list of tech sites as ranked by Nielsen, we come in at number six. So there's not terribly many things that come in ahead of us. So you know, we're reasonably prominent in that stuff. More to the point, when you look at all those titles, yeah, I would argue that we are easily the most open source sympathetic title <laughs> out of anything that you'll find on that list. You know, we regularly review Linux software and Linux distros, we run you know, Linux tweaking tips, we have discussions more broadly about you know, philosophy, freedom of information, things like that, and you know, I come to conferences like this and Bar Camp Geelong and those sorts of things, and I write about them, so you know, we're definitely you know, involved. You know. We've got a fairly simple philosophy. The whole aim of Lifehacker is, you know, how to do everything better. And in that context, I think Linux fits right in. It's a really easy sell. But as the editor, I've still got to say to myself, okay, so how much of this stuff should I be running? And, you know, one way I can do that, and a way that's easier now than it used to be when I worked on print magazines, is I could actually find out how many people who come and visit the site actually use Linux. That'll give me a fair idea of what the level of interest is. So, you know, um, I went into Google Analytics and I looked up, okay, for the last year, you know, what are the operating systems that people are using as they come in, you know, to read stuff on Lifehacker? And this is what you get. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, yeah, if you're curious, out of those Linux users, about 50% of them use Firefox, about a third of them use Chrome, and then it's distributed over all sorts of weird things. So, but um, what struck me, that, that percentage is 3.23%. That's pretty low. I'll be honest, that's lower than I was expecting. I wasn't, you know, I was under no illusions that anything other than Windows was going to be on the top of the list. Um, and certainly in terms of overall market share, Windows is lower than it would be in the community as a whole. But, you know, I really thought there might have been a bit more interest, you know, going on there. Now, of course, there's a chicken and egg aspect to this argument. It might well be that if we wrote more about the topic, we'd have more people coming in 
uh, and reading it. Uh, it's also obviously true that you know, it's not like an operating system is a sole commitment where you run run environment and that's it. Maybe it's just the case that lots of the people who are very happily running Linux on multiple boxes just always come and read us from their Mac or their Windows machine or their iPhone. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, if I'm looking at it from a cold, hard publishing perspective, and publishers are cold, hard people, and that is how they're going to look at it, you know, it'd be really hard to actually argue that I should be running more than, you know, at best, two or three Linux-related posts a week, because that's about the percentage of the audience <laughs> that would seem to have a direct interest. Now, as it happens, if anyone's been on Lifehacker this week, we've run a lot more than two or three posts just relating to this conference. Um, and interestingly enough, they've got really good traffic numbers. So, yeah, you can't just make decisions based on that sort of data, I guess is what I'd say. But at the same time, if I had the access and if I could go in to the analytics for CNET or the SMH or news.com and do the same thing, I'd hazard a guess that the actual numbers might be even lower. And I reckon, if I was a Sydney Morning Herald journalist, and I said, oh, I've got this awesome story about Linux, and I had a narky editor or a narky publisher, I'd have real trouble persuading them that, hey, this is something I should run. Because they'd just say, we don't see the readership there. We're not sure why it's happening. And I guess, you know, it seems basic and obvious, but that's, my, that's reason number one why we maybe don't see as much coverage. It's just there's a belief that there's just not that much interest that's, you know, going on in that space. Okay, now, there's another important factor to consider when it comes to how Linux gets covered, when it comes to how open source gets covered, when it comes to how anything gets covered, in fact. Um, and that's the fact, these days, if you ask me, there just aren't enough actual journalists to go around. Um, I'll give you a case in point. When I started as a technology journalist back in 1994 on a weekly enterprise title called PC Week, we had 10 full-time staff putting that together. So we only had to put out an edition once a week and we had access to a US feed. So, you know, it was a good training ground. We didn't have to work too hard. We had time to invest in stories. Now, you know, now I'm on Lifehacker, which is actually more commercially successful, bigger site. I'm the only full-time Australian staff member on that site. I've got an awesome night editor and she's brilliant and she helps deal with a lot of the incoming US stuff. But I have to share her with Gizmodo and Kotaku as well. So, you know, it's, you know, that's a really big shift in terms of what's happened and I've seen it on every title that I've ever been involved with. The number of journalists who are out there is less. Um, and at the same time, we're expected to do more. We've all got websites now. There's a demand for continuous coverage. We're supposed to produce video. We're supposed to produce podcasts. We're supposed to take pictures. I do most of these things apart from the writing very badly, but I have to do them, <laughs> and it soaks up a lot of time. And what that leads to in the end is that in that context, you know, it can be really hard to justify saying, oh, by the way, I'm off to Ballarat for a week. <laughs> it's just really, really, really difficult because you've got to do the rest of your job. Um, so, so maybe the simple solution, and the solution that a lot of people adopt is, oh, okay, we just won't get involved in the first place. So, and I, I guess what I'm saying there is that, you know, what you might think of as conscious neglect, we've decided to ignore this because we don't think it's interesting, could also just be exhaustion and lack of resources. Because there really are only so many stories that you can actually get written. So I think that's factor number two in how things get covered. We just don't have the people. Now, one way you can overcome that staffing problem is to use a freelance journalist. And this is something I actually know an awful lot about because between 2000 and 2010, I was a freelance IT journalist. That was all I did. I would write stories for uh, pretty much anyone who would have me. Uh, and in fact, this, this is the first LCA I've been to where I'm a salaried staff member <laughs> as opposed to being someone who's just going around trying to pluck as many stories as possible from as many sessions as possible. It's, it's more fun this way, I've got to say. Um, and yeah, but if, you know, if the editor's got a freelance budget, which is also a bit of a big question mark these days, but let's suppose they do, they could say to someone like me or to someone like Stilgarian who's here covering this year's conference for the CBS titles, you know, go along, find the stories and do, all, do that. You know? And sometimes that works really, really well. Um, 
when I went to LTA 2010, the one in Wellington, um, I was the only freelancer there and I wrote a lot of stories. I actually beat my personal best record and managed to write for six different titles in the course of that event. So, you know, that was, I could find good angles for all of them. It worked out pretty well. So, you know, that was great. And it saved time for all those titles who didn't have to send someone all the way to New Zealand and bring them all the way back. Um, but, you know, so sometimes it works well, but you know, sometimes it doesn't, and there's one big reason why. Ah, it's economics, it's really simple. Yeah, you don't become a journalist to get rich in the first place. Um, you certainly don't become a technology journalist to get rich. Um, and the big problem is that in sort of the coming up towards 20 years that I've been writing, the freelance rates have either stayed exactly the same or they've gone down. <laughs> so apparently publishers just haven't heard of inflation. You know, it's become a more competitive market. There are you know, thousands of bloggers who are writing really good stuff about topics they're passionate about and doing it for nothing. There are thousands more bloggers who are ripping off that content, putting Google AdWords on it and trying to make money out of that as well. But regardless, the, the end result is that the pay doesn't change, and that meant that every year I was a freelancer, I had to do more work than I'd had to do the year before just to generate the same amount of money, and ultimately I'm not sure how much longer <laughs> that's going to be sustainable for anybody. So leaving aside my personal banking woes, you know, the other potential issue you can have there is that you've got to convince an editor that the story is actually you know, worthwhile and work them through the complexities. Um, yeah, so occasionally you're lucky and you'll get told, oh, just go to the event, write what you think's interesting and we'll publish it. And that's brilliant when it happens, but usually it doesn't. Usually you've got to justify every story you're trying to sell in there. And in a lot of cases, the editors don't know very much about individual open source products or the open source market as large. And yeah, it can be really hard to get them into it. Even taking them through something which is 101 for this crowd, you know, free as in speech versus free as in beer, can take a while. You know, journalists like free speech and they like free beer, but they don't necessarily want to get engaged in the complexities that go between them. So, um, <laughs> There's slight hysteria in the front row. <laughs> so, yeah, so sometimes you have to spend a lot of time explaining that to an editor. And again, that's a problem. You're getting paid less and less. You've got to do more and more. And somehow now you're now doing open source tutorial for a tech editor who's not really that convinced and who maybe just wants to go off and do something else. So that kind of ties into the next sort of, you know, broader issue coming up, which is that, you know, IT, we like to think of ourselves as sensible and rational people. But the fact is that, you know, as much as any other sector of it, we are driven by fashion. There are fashions in what gets covered and in what doesn't get covered. You know? If I'm at a conference with something that's deemed popular, then it's going to be easy to sell a story. The problem with fashion is that something that's been in fashion you know, can end up out of fashion. Now, I remember when the very first LCA I ever covered, which was 2004 in Adelaide, at that point in time, stories about Linux were really in demand. Editors couldn't get enough of them. They, they, they thought they'd stumbled on the holy grail. Their idea was that if they could come up with a unique, interesting open source story, it would end up on Slashdot and their traffic would go through the roof. Every editor I know thought that way at the time. So, yeah, there was so much interest when it turned out I was going to Adelaide. I actually had two rival publications both saying, oh, whatever stories you can file from here, We'll take it. So I thought, brilliant, sold. We'll go for it. The problem is, that's not going to happen now. I really can't imagine that's going to happen now. Um, another example from the same time period of sort of how you know, Linux really was massively profitable for the publishing industry at one point. Um, in the very late 1990s, in the early 2000s, I was working at um, Australian Consolidated Press. And we were putting out the pocket book series, which is like a little guide, and it would tell you how to install CD on the front, and then it would take you in detail through um, how to install, I think even then it was Red Hat, but it's so long ago now I actually can't remember. Um, now, we, that did really well. I think we sold well above 100,000 copies of that thing, and two or three other publishers did a copycat series. So for a while there, that was this huge opportunity that everyone saw to sort of promote and get it out in the community. But again, the world's moved on, the fashion has changed, and nobody produces those kind of titles anymore. 
Um, so, yeah, what's the new fashion? I think everyone knows. You know, the go-to technology topic, the one that people are, yeah, that you'll, you'll see on every site that you go to these days, is Apple. That's the thing that gets written about the most. If you looked at those screen grabs, the other one that comes up a lot in the mainstream press is Facebook. I think it's debatable whether Facebook is even a technology issue most of the time, but it definitely shows up in those sections. But at the end of the day, you know, it's definitely... Apple is the thing. Um, it's the topic that no matter what you write about and sometimes seemingly no matter how repetitive it is, lots and lots of people will come and read it. And yeah, again, I'm going to have to admit I am as guilty of this as the next journalist. You know, I went along to the excellent keynote that Bruce Perrins did earlier in the week and I thought, oh, I've got to write that up for Lifehacker. So how did I write that up for Lifehacker? <laughs> Now, you know, to be fair, that was one of the many things that Bruce said in his speech. certainly wasn't the only thing. It's probably impossible to get the entire speech into sort of a news story, but yeah, that was the angle I went for. But actually, from the perspective of this topic, um, Bruce you know, actually made the same point about how open source has gone out of fashion. This was, yeah, well, his comment, yeah. We've seen these signs that Linux and open source have peaked and the lockdown platform is beating us in many ways. This is pretty much, you know, what has sort of happened. So, now, I don't think that change is solely because the media stopped writing stories about Linux so much, started writing more stories about Apple. You know, on the other hand, I don't suppose that's got nothing to do with it because this is how lots of people find things out. Um, but, yeah, you know, my third reason why things get covered the way they are is that there are fashion cycles. And the only good thing about fashion cycles um, is that eventually things might become fashionable again. We can but hope. Now, another a little minor issue, sort of interesting thing about how open source gets covered, um, because open source is dealing with collaborative projects, because there's very rarely one person who's in charge, one person who's the voice of a given thing, um, it can be hard to get a definitive statement on things and it's very contrary to the way that most journalists are used to working where there's going to be a spokesperson, there's going to be an expert, there's going to be that one person who represents the official definitive this is what we're doing and it's not going to change kind of view. Um, that just isn't the way that necessarily happens with a lot of successful open source projects. You know, you've just got to send a random email off to someone and maybe they'll reply and maybe they won't and then maybe someone else will disagree with them. Um, and it's not to say there's anything wrong with the process at all or that journalists probably shouldn't toughen up and work out how to deal with it. But I think it's so out of you know, whack for some people that if they can't see an easy structure, if it's outside their normal understanding, they just ignore it. So that's kind of reason number four, but of all of them, it's the one that I think that's where the journalists should just man up and learn how to do the job properly. <laughs> now, there's a disadvantage to having a boss as well. And that's, you know, this obsession you know, with a, a spokesperson creates a cult of celebrity, and the cult of celebrity often you know, leads you down the path of um, trivia, you know, just not covering things in a very sensible way. And this happens, you know. As far as most of my colleagues in the world of IT writing are concerned, yeah, there is one celebrity, one celebrity only in the whole world of Linux, and that's Linus himself. Yeah, if I said to an editor, hey, I'm going to LCA, the first thing they're going to say to me is, oh, will Linus be there? And can you get an interview with him? And you know, the, the answers to those questions are, well, look, yes, he may well be there, but we won't know until he gets there. And if he is there, he won't be presenting. He'll just be floating around in shorts and offering sarcastic comments from the floor because that's what he does. <laughs> and, you know, and as far as can you get an interview, it's like, well, look, you know, I can, you know, I can ask. I can ask if you really want me to. But you know, he's not going to say anything that he hasn't already said on the mailing list if you really want to go and look it up. Um, and what I won't say, but what I would like to say is, look, I really hate the idea that I've got to stalk this poor bloke who's just here to learn about technology just to try and get him to say something controversial about Apple. Right? It's just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't see that as a useful kind of thing to do. Sometimes you have to do that because I've got a living to earn, but the triviality factor can kind of kick in there. And, you know, again, I have been guilty of this in the past. You know, I once asked Linus one of the dumbest questions of my career, and it's up, it's up on the screen here. <laughs> I used to write a column for Atomic called Trivial Geek Questions. It was an advice column. And someone wrote in and basically wanted to know, how much would Linus charge to come to my birthday party? And, you know, I was amazed. I, I emailed Linus to ask him, and he often, if he doesn't like a question from a journalist, he just ignores it. That's what he's already done, always done. But he answered this one. <laughs> I don't think you can pay me enough. <laughs> I 
I think that quote speaks for itself. <laughs> but now, yeah, this is, you might view this as utterly, utterly trivial. And yeah, you're probably right. But you know, on the other hand, it does have you know, a humanising effect. You know? And you know, if Bruce is right, you know, and we do need to be working harder to you know, reassert the visibility of you know, open source, then you know, a humanising effect isn't a terrible thing, I don't suppose. Okay, now this is the other, you know, the final issue I guess to dive into, and something that I have heard quite a lot over the years, is the argument that, oh well, the reason you don't write about open source is because you're getting advertisements from open source's rivals, that's your source of income, you don't want to do anything to offend them. Now, yeah, it's a conspiracy theory, and the problem with it, like a lot of conspiracy theories, is there just isn't the evidence to back it up. Certainly not in my experience. I just, I have not run into this anywhere that I've you know, ever worked. You know, for the most part, the editorial guys have no idea what's getting sold in and vice versa. There's meant to be a Chinese wall and everywhere that I've worked there actually has been a Chinese wall. So I just, I just personally haven't seen it happen. Uh, problem is the perception is quite widespread. Um, again, back when I was working at APC, I remember getting a really annoyed reader letter from someone saying, yeah, the, the, we were obsessed with writing about Windows and it was only because we got all this advertising from Microsoft and we were completely corrupt. Um, and I thought, you know, it's a ridiculous argument because we were a computer magazine, writing about Windows was something we were going to have to do. But the main reason it was a ridiculous argument was because in the five years that I was directly associated with that title, we never saw one single advertisement from Microsoft run the entire time. I mean, Microsoft didn't need brand awareness with APC readers. It was spending its advertising money at television and Women's Day and giving a small fortune to Mick Jagger so they could use part of his song. That was where their dollars were going. They weren't getting anywhere near us. So I wrote back to the reader and, and I said that, and you know, I never heard back from them again. Because you know, people don't like the facts getting in the way of a good story, even if they don't like it when they think journalists do that as well. <laughs> now, that, I suppose, leads to you know, the bigger question, you know, I'm discussing whether there's enough or fair coverage, but you know, maybe the question is, does it really matter? Is there any need for you know, the open source world to get covered in sort of mainstream media? You know, if the Herald Sun and the Daily Telegraph, which are the big selling papers, you know, never talk about Linus, even if he's kissing somebody, and even if they never mention the fact that when they're talking about how you could do this in Microsoft Office, maybe you could do that in LibreOffice as well, and does it really matter now that we're in the internet age? That information is out there. People can set up their own titles. People can go to Google and search out their own information. You know, everything's one search away. Everyone can talk about it. Maybe it's just something that you know, should sort of go to the sideline. You know, it's also you know, the other issue, and tying into this, whether you want to be in there, is you know, for a large part of the population, they really do think that journalists are scum, that we're illiterate, that we're ill-informed, that we've got no ethics. This view's always been around. It's got a lot more common in the last year when we've had incidents like you know, hacking scandals in the UK, but the view has always been around. Um, now, does this apply to technology journalists as well? I couldn't help wondering. <laughs> It's hard to tell. There was a survey done of Australians last year which said that only 32% of Australians trust the media at all, which is lower than the global average for the same survey, which is 49. On the other hand, the same survey said that 69% of them trusted technology companies. And so I thought, well, maybe I'm lucky and maybe the fact that I write about technology ups the average just a little bit and you land somewhere in the middle. <laughs> but, you know, you could equally take the view that, hey, do we really want to get written about by an industry that many people think is really, really dubious. So maybe you could take that view. But the problem with that approach, and again, this is something that Bruce had touched on in his keynote, um, is that if you do that, you are in one way condemning, quite possibly, the Linux user base to sort of hover around the 3% of life hacker readers level that it's hovering around you know, at the moment. And I genuinely can't imagine that for anybody who's at this conference, that's the position that you know, you'd want to take. You know that this process can produce great results. Um, you know that it has really important implications for society, which is you know, something that we've got covered in this morning's keynote more eloquently than I could ever do it. Um, and yeah, the end thing is you'd like more people to be using this stuff. Um, and in that context, you know, getting open source written about more often 
just, you know, it can't hurt. It can't be the whole answer, but, you know, it probably can't hurt. So in the spirit of being practical, because this is a practical conference, and in fact because Life Hacker itself is a practical title, I guess I wanted to round out by offering advice. So you're involved with some project, you think, this is awesome, this is great, I want to get more people, you know, I'd like to get someone to write about this, I sort of want to go and approach them, you know, how can I um, go about doing it? Now, look, it's really not that difficult. This stuff is not rocket science. Rocket science, different presentation, probably somewhere else on the schedule. But, <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, getting the basics right is, you know, what counts because, like I said, we're busy, we're underpaid. The easier you make it for us, the easier things will go along. So, really, it comes down to four really obvious <laughs> and simple rules. So, of which number one, the most important one really is, you know, identify the audience. Work out, if you're thinking, oh, I'd like to be written about in such and such a place, work out what it is they actually write about and put a little bit of attention to it. I mean, as I said, Lifehacker's whole thing is we want to know yeah, how to do everything better. So we're always interested in cool new software, ways to make that software work more efficiently, ways to customise it. You know, we like free stuff. We like stuff we can get our hands on. So there's lots of projects we want to hear about, but there's lots of things we wouldn't want to hear about. You know? um, I don't want to hear about how much money your project has for funding. I don't care who's been elected onto the Linux Australia board. You know? I don't care that some big customer has just installed your software. <laughs> you know? um, I don't care about this idea you've got that's not actually a real product. So, and you can work all of this out if you spend about five minutes scrolling down the site and looking at the kind of things that we do write. And this applies to any site that you wanted to end up on. Just have an idea of what they want. And if you can't see a way that what you're doing fits into what they're writing about, find somewhere that does. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just banging your head against a brick wall. So um, being fashionable, I've discussed this as well. You know, it definitely helps. If you can find a way to hook yourself into the topic that you know, is currently <laughs> in the charts, you know, then that, that can help. So if you're involved with some sort of new open source music player, just get right in there and explain why it's so much better than iTunes because that'll get you, you know, hooked in there. You know, if you've got some you know, great open source conference on and you want to sort of promote the fact it's happening, get the keynote speaker to say that Facebook is evil and then get him to go out and talk about that. <laughs> and, <you> know, <laughs> yeah. If you're not sure what's fashionable, Actually, these days it's really easy. Just go and take a look at the technology section on Google News. And that will give you a fairly good idea of what lots and lots of people want to cover and sort of give you a way in. Rule number three is be concise. Um, that's just, yeah, don't bombard people with loads and loads of information. Once you've worked out what you want to tell them, send them a quick email, say, hi, we've got this project, here's a link, talk to me if you want to know anything, this is why I think it'd be cool. That really is, you know, all you've got to do. Um, and I, I, again, it sounds really obvious, but I deal every day with PR people who are paid far more money than I am to contact me and try and persuade me to write things. And I can't even get that right. So if you can get that right, you'll be ahead of most of them. Um, and number four is be contactable. Have some contact details in there. You'll probably be contacted by email, so they'll have that address, but put a phone number in as well, because if somebody wants to get something done in a real hurry, if they're thinking, I need to know now, the phone still, you know, it's got a role to play. Um, again, sounds obvious, but it's, you know, that's what you've got to do. And, yeah, you know, if you follow those steps, the chances are that, um, you know, your odds of coverage, you know, they're going to go up. It's not, it's, they're not guaranteed because nothing's guaranteed, but it's definitely going to help. So, the big lesson that maybe should come out of all this, you know, if there really is a big anti-open source conspiracy out there in the tech media, then no one has got around to telling me about it for 20 years or so. <laughs> Um, and you don't have to be cheesy and tabloid to get you know, open source sort of noticed. You know. It's also worth remembering, you know, if, you, if you don't get noticed, you know, don't take it personally. Because you know. you know, journalists, you know, we're like coders, we're entirely fallible human beings and you know, we make mistakes. You know. I can always do my job better and you guys can always help me in doing that job better. And yeah, you know, if you do lead a journalist you know, to a great story, we're going to love you to bits forever. So that's pretty much all I had to say. So. Any questions? <laughs> oh. 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 Nope. <laughs> oh, belated. I'm going to have to clean this room afterwards, aren't I? <laughs> question. Yeah. Your take. Hi, Angus. A uh, question on terminology. Yeah. Uh, free software versus open source. As a journalist, are you able to offer any insight uh, into the choice between one term or the other? 
in, in terms of what, why someone would choose, choose to talk about one versus the other? Well, yeah. we see a lot of coverage um, using the term open source. Yeah. Very little that talks about the uh, ethics or the philosophy that drives the development of this software. Yeah. Um, at, like, that comes on, in some ways that comes down to, because as I said, I just don't think the distinction and the importance of it is well understood generally amongst you know, people who write about it. Lots of, not many people sit down and think about those things. You know. um, I had some idea about a lot of this stuff before I started coming to LCA, but there's no doubt sitting through a bunch of keynotes has made me a keener you know, observer of all that stuff. Um, so, and it just, also it's because honestly in a certain, in an editorial mindset, people hear the word free and they like the word free and they want free just to mean you get it for nothing. Their only, free as in beer is what gets people excited. Free as in beer is the thing that's going to end up on today tonight. You know, <laughs> free as in speech is just, it's just a harder road to hoe and it just doesn't, I'm not, it just doesn't line up as well. And I know there's a bit of a rambling incoherent answer, but I just, I generally think if the distinction is not well made, it comes down to the people writing about it, not always understanding the distinction or writing in a hurry and again I bet I could find examples where I've stuffed it up and I think I am reasonably across it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You should take the question. Yeah. Yeah. Are we passing the mic around or are we? <laughs> yeah but it depends on you because... Oh yeah, oh, sorry, behind. <laughs> take control, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Putting aside the question of whether or not we want to be in the press, do press releases work? Press releases can work, but my, you know, they have to be announcing something that, again, is generally of interest to the title. And I always think the best, you know, writing press releases is obviously useful because you can put all the key things you want to say in a format everyone can use. The most effective way to send a press release is to send that, but to, top, but to rather than just sending it to everybody, and let, you know, if you can personalise and say, oh yeah, we've just got this announcement, I thought you'd be interested because. Even if you've got time to do that one sentence, that is, you know, someone's more likely to think, oh, this is useful, whereas if the headline for the press release doesn't grab them, they may never get any further into it. So they've definitely got a role to play. Um, but I think the more, the more any personalization effort can really make a difference there. So, so did you um, receive any from LinuxConf or has LinuxConf sent any out? Yes, LinuxConf in fact has sent out three or four of them. Um, I, in truth, I probably wouldn't register that as much because LinuxConf is part of my routine. I know when it's going to come up, I'm on the mailing list, I'm interested for my own sake. So I, I, in my, that sense, I'm kind of past it, but I'm, as far as I'm aware, and in fact I did see them, um, the releases went out. The other thing that confuses it is that normally for this event, I'd be on the press list, I'd get more press contact. I happen to be on the speakers list this year, and it means you actually have a slightly different experience of that stuff. So I wouldn't want to pass definitive judgment on it for this event for that reason. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, just a, a question on, on um, like selling, not as in money selling, but selling to the media or selling media stories in a sense of promoting them. Uh, what do you think are the best elements or the most important elements within, other than the ethical issues, but the, the, the forms or styles of Linux and open source software that would actually cause journalists to write more about them? Um. I think for an, for an, for in an awful lot of cases, it's just making people aware that, hey, there's an alternative here that does everything that this expensive program you know about. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to, you know, freeze and beer there, but I, I, I genuinely think that a lot of people still don't realise how good a lot of this stuff is and how feasible it is to, you know, have an entirely kind of open source experience um, and not, you know, there, there's a lot of, in a lot of people's heads it's still vaguely tied to the command line and for most people the command line is terrifying, that's the last thing they want to know about. And I just, so I, I guess from my, I think, you know, functionality in that is basically saying we can do this and it's really awesome and explaining what, you know, what's possible with it I still think is, you know, um, an important thing to do. So, I mean, again, sounds fairly basic, but I think that's that's what an awful lot of people aren't aware of that these you know alternatives exist. So, okay, down in the. <laughs> I promise I'll stop neglecting this side of the room in a minute. <laughs> hey, um, so I'm organising uh, PyCon. Uh, yep. in Australia this year. So as somebody who is facilitating an event that we might like the press to come along to, uh, what can I do as a conference organiser to make the experience of the press uh, better at our conference? Um, good great. I mean, I, I didn't do PyCon this year. I actually went as a press the year beforehand and my memory of it in general was it was pretty good. Um, yes, there was an, even a non-controversial presentation by Matt Pesci, so anything's possible. But um, <laughs> um, press, you know, 
some of it is just saying, hey, these are the, yeah, singling things out in the program, saying these are the sessions you really might find interesting is sometimes good because people aren't necessarily going to sit and look at the whole <laughs> schedule. Um, being realistic and thinking particularly in terms of how PyCon works, big disadvantage it's got, it runs on a weekend. A lot of journalists are going to say, stuff this, I'm not going out on a Saturday. I mean, that sounds brutal, but it's true. Um, in that context, picking out something and saying, hey, would you like to chat to these guys in advance and get a bit of an idea of what they're talking about? It's also better for you because if your ultimate aim is to get more people knowing the conference is on, it's better to be written about before it happens than to be written about while people are there. So um, that said, make sure there's somewhere they can go and plug in their computer, which again, from memory, Python didn't have a problem with that, but you know, this event's good. You know, everybody at this event wants power and wireless, and journalists definitely want power and wireless, and that's, that's always a really straightforward thing you can do to make it easier for them to file. Um, oh, we'll go over here just for <laughs> that <way> back now. <laughs> there we go. Oh. I just wanted to ask you, um, you spoke, one of the things you said before, you know, don't tell us what company is, you know, running your software, etc. So with, um, when it comes to open source projects, for example, there's a lot of large organisations um, within Australia who have just in the last X amount of years, whether it be turning from a proprietary um, run website to an open source kind of website, etc. And for when it comes to the promotion of open source, um, you know, for other companies to see that, hey, one of Australia's largest leading banks is actually running all their websites um, in an open content management system, or it's being done at um, our, some of our largest insurance companies and etc. Surely something like that would not only be interesting for the tech community, but also business oh, and then oh, also... No, absolutely. To, no, to, to be clear the, on um, that, what I was saying is in my context as Lifehacker Editor, yep. I don't want to know. There are plenty of media for whom that is the story. And in fact, when I've covered these events as a freelancer in the past, the first thing I've done is gone through the whole schedule and said, right, which one of these actually represents a user story? Because for large swathes, especially of the business-oriented technology press, user stories are absolutely important. So this comes back to the know your audience principle. For some people, that is absolutely the angle you want to go with. So I don't want to suggest that's not something to pursue. It's not something you could pursue with me in my current role because I wouldn't be interested, but somebody will be absolutely, as people kill, user stories are good and it's, they're also, they're as scarce as hen's teeth because when you are a large bank, your chances of actually talking to the press about anything you're doing are quite low. So any ins we can get are great. So definitely there is a space for that. It just has to match the right title. Yep. So, uh, this gentleman over here. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> I'm exercising you. <laughs> Sorry, two-part question. Yeah. Um, I've, I've worked uh, part-time as a journalist over the last few years myself. Um, so the first one I wanted to ask, just clarification on one of the slides. You are admitting that all journalists are scum. Is that, that's correct, right? <laughs> as a journalist, I have to keep an open mind on all questions. So <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, in all, um, seriously, um, one of the issues uh, that I've found to be a, a sort of a continuing thing, and it, it, indeed it's compounding, um, is the amount of inertia in public opinion. And uh, just recently in my neighborhood, somebody blew about a million dollars um, on this, you know, on building up computer centers in remote areas um, of the South Pacific. And they are doomed. They're absolutely doomed to failure because they're using the wrong technology. And that's in spite of, you know, a group of us working really cons on a concerted basis to try and change minds around uh, Linux, free software, different alternative hardware, various things. Um, in, in my impression has always been that it's not so much the journalistic side of it. I thought that actually writing a weekly column would be sufficient to start moving opinions. And it did to a small degree. but. The impression I seem to get is that it's more a marketing issue, you know, in that sort of broader sense of building awareness and, and brand identity and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering if you can comment a little bit on that, whether you're, you're seeing the same sort of phenomenon. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's fair to say that while people are keen to get press coverage, you know, I think, particularly in terms of technology choices, that the role of media can easily be overestimated to a certain extent we follow, you know, if, if someone's doing that analysis idea of saying, oh, who's coming in you know, and using the site, that's looking at what's already happened. That's not changing what's happening. That's reacting to what's already there. And media is often like that. It likes to think of itself as agenda setting, but 
I, yeah, I, I often don't think that's the case. And I think it's true that lots of other things come into play, especially when you're talking about those, anything that becomes a large public project. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the background independent of what's being written around that area. Now, there's some great stories you've written about that if people can find out how those processes happen. But, yeah, it's definitely not, yeah, I could write about these issues continuously from now to the end of time, and I'm only going to be a tiny drop in the ocean. Lots of things go on. doesn't mean you, sh you shouldn't do them, but there's definitely lots of other factors that come into play as well. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'm afraid we ran out of time. Um, on behalf of LCA, this team, this year team, um, this is a thank you gift. Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you for a nice talk. <laughs>